Well, thanks, guys. We're kicking this off. It's a fantastic conversation that we're going to have. Um, I want to talk about flow and flow states and the science of flow states. And so I know Rudy and Natasha, that shows up in your lives quite a bit, and you guys love to talk about it. So um, maybe give us a little bit of your experiences. How does flow show up in your life? What is flow to you? Natasha, after you, you take the floor, dear. Um, sure. <clears throat> yeah, for me, well, in my quote unquote nine to five as an entrepreneur, it shows up while I'm working. Um, I actually grew up with um, ADD, so you know my ability to laterally think is is innate. But um, I started listening to podcasts faster than normal was one of those, and it's how to actually like tune into how your brain works. And so instead of going literally, mine typically just goes out all at once. And so for me, that has been sort of my definition of flow. When I'm working, I tend to work really quickly, and what would take someone five hours to figure out, it'll take me one hour. Um, and the application to sports, wake surfing has been sort of my space to play. Um, it's been amazing to, um, while healing from Lyme, I know Stephen Cutler, you have a, a similar story um, and just reconnecting with nature. So for me, what's in that space, it, it just really lets me not think about anything. And as an entrepreneur, that's something it's hard to turn your brain off. And so after about 30 minutes of being on the boat and getting behind boat wake surfing that's when it really turns on and what's amazing about that is in the next day I just can get so much more done but in a more effective smart way not just okay I've worked harder I've worked intentionally smarter so I definitely feel the effects of flow afterwards um, as an athlete and then also um, working so it's amazing hey. you, Rudy. Rudy how about Good you answer. yeah so the first time I've, I've ever thought of the experience of flow was with Lindsay and Stephen Kotler at one of the weekends on a ski weekend years ago and I went there with my wife who's also a professional dancer a choreographer so we were applying flow on the mountain and growing up um, I think it's always been kind of a subconscious habit and I never really thought about it I started playing ice hockey which is a very fast twitch fast reaction sport at four years old, played competitive hockey my whole life, uh, played football, I was a skateboarder, was in you know pools and half pipes, uh, was a downhill skier my entire life. So it was always like inherent that I was in a flow state and didn't realize how addicted my body was to it until after I left college and started my own company and became a CEO that like, if I don't exercise, physically, I can't detoxify properly. Mentally, I can't detoxify properly. And I need like that fast twitch response. So I'm always a kind of attracted to those sports that balances my neurology out. And my wife's like, you know, go out and skateboard, go out and, you know, roller hockey, something else, or I'm just not sane. So I'm, for me, tonight's conversation, I'm super stoked to have it with dear friend, Lindsay. Super stoked that, uh, you know, Stephen, you're here to kind of explain and nerd out with you, but I'm, I would, I'm really interested in the accessibility standpoint on how the everyday Joe or the weekend warrior can kind of understand when they're in a flow state and apply it to their, before walking into our boardroom, for example, like what are those techniques and also the recovery techniques. So if you're in high flow state, how do you pull yourself out and recover so you can be in a, another high flow state later? Yeah, all right. Very cool. Avisha. You know, I think there's multiple different types of flow states. And as to how I get into them, at one point, I actually heard Stephen talking about something along the lines of a like getting lost on Wikipedia or just some type of micro flow state where you look up and don't realize that you got distracted by something. And honestly, I think that's the type of flow state I tend to get in the most frequently, because I find myself going down like, rabbit holes of reading through research journals where I see one and then it references another one, I references another one. And then two hours later, I realized the work that I was supposed to be doing. But <laughs> that's like that type. And I'd love to hear Stephen's thoughts on that later if I'm just like uh, patting myself on the back saying, oh, I was in flow. But growing up, I would say the nerd in me is gonna come out yet again, which is video games. It's mm -hmm. definitely something that turn it on, go in and it encompasses the entire mind in a way that it's sort of cheating because it really grabs you in with lots of different stuff. Yeah, I was but gonna say. <laughs> I think there, 
call my addiction an addiction or call it a <laughs> yeah. flow state and I'm addicted yeah. to the flow state. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll see what the experts think about that. Right, exactly. I went into that. I wish I was more like Natasha and it happened a lot during work. <laughs> yeah. Good yeah. word, addiction, right? So we're going to get into hopefully the science and the neurotransmitters and the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, right? Because that mm -hmm. is, those are addictive uh, 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 feelings. Yeah, and speaking of uh, Natasha and work, I mean, I was totally, uh, I've missed like two co consecutive calls with Natasha because I've been so in flow at work. Like I just like lost track of time. And I don't know if I could use flow as my excuse for, gosh, I was so, I'm sorry, I didn't, I missed our call because I was in flow. Um, but yeah, it's, it's what happens. Um, all right, so, but I've heard so much about Steven and Lindsay. I can't wait to bring them to the table here. And why don't we just go right ahead and bring them up. Um, so you guys know Steven, but Steven Kotler, I was reading his bio here. It's so incredibly impressive. Um, so I learned so much here. Steven's a New York Times bestselling author. He's an award-winning journalist and the executive director of Flow Research Collective. He's one of the world's leading experts on human performance and the author of 11 books, including The Future is Faster Than You Think, Stealing Fire, Bold, Abundance, and The Rise of Superman. His work has been nominated for two Pulitzer Prizes, been translated into, into over 40 languages and appeared in over 100 publications, including the New York Times Magazine, Atlantic Monthly, Time, Wired, Forbes. And he's also the co-founder of the Rancho del Chihuahua Dog Sanctuary. Can't wait to hear more about that. All right, and Lindsay, he's, she's one of the most accomplished women in free skiing. She's been named uh, Powder Magazine Skier of the Year has starred in ski films from Warren Miller, Teton Gravity Research, and Sherpa Cinema, and is one of the first, or is the first female to be featured on the cover of Free Skier Magazine. Um, she's also a director. She's a creative force whose talent has transcended the world of skiing. Her photography has been featured in National Geographic and Outside <laughs> Magazine, and is the creator and host of the podcast Showing Up. All right, well. Welcome to the table. Let's get Lindsay up here. So those bios don't suck. You guys have done all right for yourselves. Pretty sure. impressive. I just want to also know- High performers. Yeah, exactly. But Linz, I also want to add on what a great friend and like your spirit, like getting to know you as a friend and knowing your, you know, your inner workings and your, in, and just your, your subconscious. You're such an amazing human being. It's an honor, honestly, to be your friend. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much for saying that. So, hey, Thanks for getting a hyperbaric chamber. <laughs> we should talk about that too. <laughs> for okay, sure. anyways. Absolutely. Hey, but Stephen, thank you so much for joining us this evening. So super psyched you guys are here. First question, you ready? Um, Linz, I'm gonna go after you if you don't mind. And then Stephen, if you can piggyback. Linz, do you have an example of like your most epic um, your most epic flow moment that you can share with us in your career, possibly skiing, or there's so many different sports that you're, that you're a part of. And then Steven, can you nerd out and just kind of give a flow 101 and how it relates to neuroanatomy, neurotransmitters, our sympathetic system, our parasympathetic system? For sure. Yeah, can I? I also just want to get everybody to to check in with Stephen here. He's um, I've been actually taking his course uh, for the last I don't know um, as I can get it in, uh, and I'm just uh, I want him to get recognized right away because he has created this language, and we're so lucky to have his time um, that puts into words and into a framework and into a language that, uh, not only science can get behind, but the rest of us can start to really apply to our life. So just really excited to share, uh, this, this, this state that we all know that we've never been able to have a language to talk about. Absolutely. So thank you for creating that. Um, the, uh, he's such a mad scientist. We're just so lucky to have him. And here I am just talking my face off. So you asked me to uh, talk about a flow state. <clears throat> um, the most epic flow state that you can remember. Looking back after understanding Kotler's work, like looking back, like, holy crap, I was in like epic, an epic moment in that flow state. 
Yes, it is such a treat to get to share this story. Um, and it's, a, it's not short. Um, Go as long as you need. The, the, uh, there's, what I love about um, this flow work is that it's not just the fluffy side. It's not just the happy side. It's, uh, it's really talking about the work that it takes to basically live and do things that only a su superhero could do. Uh, and um, this was one of those like not the prettiest motivators, um, but the original reason why I stepped up to ever even consider um, hitting a cliff that you shouldn't live off of, you know, seven stories high. Um, and after I'd heard people tell me that um, the female body was incapable of uh, landing such a stunt um, and having these belief systems be the norm because uh, there hadn't been a female to do that yet. Um, and so I really got into the belief um, around that I needed to shift for myself uh, about challenging that universal truth um, that we all sort of accepted as like the edge and didn't even imagine questioning it. Um, there's a certain line in Jackson Hole that um, a lot of the guys had hit, but there hadn't been a female. Uh, there also hadn't been much representation of females in, um, in any sort of ski uh, magazine or film. And to, uh, to, to, you had to perform at the same level of the, as the guys in order to qualify for getting your footage or your, um, your, your availability, availability to be there, your, your, your validity. Does that make sense? Yes. So basically nice. I, I had to hit something really big um, and I had to change my belief system around it in order to accomplish that. Uh, and at first my motivation was a little bit like, screw you, watch this. Like, you don't think I can do it because no one could, no one thought I could do it because no one had. And, um, and I was, it was a little bit of that, but then over about a year that it took to actually prepare my body and my mind, um, and, and then step up to this big line and end up um, experiencing a complete flow state during the whole thing, which to me is translated as like the most pure sense of appreciation in the world. <laughs> like I've never felt anything better. And so that was significant and I uh, wanted to, to follow it. So that's, that's one of the stories, the original, um, it was when I was like six years old uh, and I feel, I, I experienced what I now have words to call a group flow state. And that actually is why I chose skiing as um, this curiosity that um, I'm learning the language around thanks to Steven. So that's my story. Love that, okay. thank you, Lindsay. Steven, can you explain what flow state is based on that? Wait, wait, wait. I want to know Steven's deepest <laughs> flow experience. Yeah, because this guy, uh, I mean, he, he went to war zones, right? He's used to dying like once every three weeks. So I want to know Steven's deepest flow story. Great question. I love that. Dying once every three weeks, you look really good. <laughs> he's, a he's a vampire. Flatliners. It's, 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 it's. <laughs> The ultimate anti-aging medicine, those rejuvenation paddles, they really Love work. Yeah. Um, and if it worked for Frankenstein. Right, for sure. Um, my deepest flow states, um, uh, I don't know, I mean, there, there were like a lot of in-situation moments. The first time I went skydiving, um, I leaped clear out of my body. Like I jumped out of the plane and I jumped <laughs> right out of my body. Like, you know, 20 feet away watching the whole thing. That's happened to me in close out waves where like they're sucked off the bottom. And if I don't make the wave, I'm going head first into the sand. So I've had a bunch of those, the time slows down. When the story I always tell is around my book, uh, Small Furry Prayer. And I got that. I Best got, name of a book ever for thanks, Small Furry Prayer. That book also, so 2007 was the recession. It was a terrible year and I got crushed. Like I made as much money that year as I made the first year I was a journalist when I was 22. It was a bad year. And uh, I finally sold a small furry prayer and to get paid, you got to finish the first draft. So it really matters. And it's 
April and I turn in the first draft and they have to approve it. I have to do the final edit and then I get paid. And I'm really proud of the book. And my editor calls me up and says, well, I've got good news and bad news. And I was like, well, what's the good news? She's like, the first 110 pages of this book are amazing. And I said, well, what's the bad news? She's like, the next 200 pages, you probably should throw them out and start over. And um, she, we talked for a while and, I, and she was right. She was totally right. Like I saw everything she saw and she was right. And um, I've, never, I've never really had writer's block, but there was so much financial pressure and I had to get this book in and I had five months to finish it. They gave me a long time. They said, get it to us in September. And I was like, okay, cool. That's plenty of time. We figured it out. May comes, I have writer's block for the first time in my life can't write. June comes, I managed to write the introduction, which is four pages and nothing else. Nothing in July. By the end of August, I'm homicidal. I'm suicidal. I'm crazy. And a friend of mine calls me up and says, hey, do you want to go downhill mountain biking? They're running the lifts at Pajarito. I had never, I didn't know how to downhill mountain bike. I hadn't been on a mountain bike really like since I was 16. Um, because I shattered my knees and couldn't really ride, but I borrowed what turned out to be a cross country bike, went to a thrift store, bought hockey pads. And <laughs> like, like the dumb, I mean, nobody ever looked dumber on a bike and, you know, got into this astoundingly deep flow state that I came home still in the flow state and uh, loved downhill mountain biking, you know, um, and came home still in flow and started to write and didn't stop for two weeks. and. I ate and slept, but I didn't stop. And I finished, I wrote the entire second half of the book, rewrote it in two weeks, turned it in because I was so pressed for time. It was the only time in my entire life I've ever, I edit every word in every book I've ever written has been rewritten 4,000 times. I just wrote it and turned it in because I was on deadline and we had rent <gasps> bills to pay. And um, my, there were no changes. Like the book was nominated for a Pulitzer and there were no changes and I still don't know who wrote it. Like I couldn't do it again. Don't know what that was. It was a two week thing. I like, I was taken over by aliens and they finished the book for me. And it's don't very, say that. I have no idea what happened though. So yeah, that's- So have you that's tried fine. to do that again? Have you tried to do that again and then given it to your editor and he's like, I just no. <laughs> no, you, you, like you don't. Yeah, seriously, I'm not that good at all ever. Like not even in, in magazine articles. I think there, I don't think there's one magazine article I've ever just comment or blog even that I just vomited out. Um, That's kind of how I feel when I make lunch or dinner. I just like, I can't remember that recipe. I don't know what happened. It just came out great. <laughs> but uh, I have a question about the financial pressure that, so I know when you're writing a book, the publishers are putting a lot of pressure on you with time and money and all that. Do you feel that pressure can actually uh, put you in a, like force you into a flow state or does it impede the flow okay so let's now go to rudy's question and talk about what is flow and a little bit about the neurobiology of flow because to, I, the answer is depends on a ton of stuff anxiety which is norepinephrine mm -hmm. predominantly mostly can block flow a little is helpful too much is terrible and it depends on a whole bunch of stuff so um makes sense starting really briefly scientists define flow it's an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best and it's those twin elements both performance and emotion that are really key and sort of make flow distinctive um it's any of those moments of uh total concentration rapt attention on the task at hand we get so sucked in everything else vanishes right time passes strangely sense of self disappears and uh all aspects of performance go both mental and physical sort of go through the roof and is this avisha am i pronouncing your name correctly I yeah you got it up avisha cool as avisha pointed out uh in when he was talking about his best flow states there's a spectrum flows like any emotion in terms of how it affects us it, you can take anger you you're a little irked you're homicidally murderous same emotion, different ends of the spectrum, right? Flow, you can have micro flow and macro flow. Micro flow is exactly what Avisha was talking about. This is where you get so sucked into a video game or so sucked in down a rabbit hole of thought 
that an hour goes by and you didn't notice it. And maybe your whole sense of self dis didn't disappear, but bodily sensation did. And like an hour later, you pop in, you're like, oh my God, I got to go to the bathroom so badly, right? Mm. You totally forgot your sense of body self, right? It wasn't totally, you had a little bit of consciousness in your head, but like that was gone. And then there's Real the other extreme, right? Lindsay's story, right? Huck's an enormous, enormous cliff. Time slows down. She feels one with the universe. Enormous amounts, right? So it's a spectrum. And um, we are, we're, we're starting to get a better handle on what that spectrum is. When psychologists define flow, because it's helpful to take it one more step, they talk about, depending on who you ask, six to nine core characteristics. I've mentioned some of these before. So the complete concentration in the present moment, the merger of action and awareness, the vanishing of self, time dilation, a couple other things. That's how you define flow by these six characteristics. They all show up. If they all show up turned to one, that's micro flow. If it, they're turned to 11, that's macro flow, right? So it's a spectrum experience. So that's why it feels like there's a whole bunch of different kinds of flow states. It's actually just a spectrum, which by the way, I should point out, there is a whole group of really smart people uh, led by a researcher named Christian Swan in Australia, who uh, I totally disagree with, but they argue that there are a whole bunch of different subflow states. There's a bunch of people who do agree with you. I'm not one of them. I think we're looking at a spectrum, but um, open question. We don't really know yet. So would you characterize the difference in that regard? Like if we were to be able to finalize and answer that question, would it be, these are the neurotransmitters that are produced during flow yeah, let me, and so in, let me in walk your spectrum. Through, yeah, let me walk you through yeah. uh, what we sort of like think we know about what's going on in the brain in the flow, in flow. There has been, um, there's a lot of knowledge. That's the one thing that's worth, like when I wrote Rise of Superman, mm -hmm. everything we knew in the world sort of went into that book. We have learned a ton since then. Research has exploded um, in the United States in Europe, uh, all, actually all over the world. There's a great, there's good flow papers coming out of Pakistan and Iran right now, don't ask. But uh, Doc Rudy asked a question earlier about flow and cortisol. One of the best cortisol studies I've seen just came out of Iran. Um, so we have a good understanding of, of what's going on in the brain and the body during flow. I won't go into crazy detail. You can ask me whatever you want and I'll try to answer it. Um, I'll keep it fairly high level. What we know is uh, when you're talking about what happens in the brain during flow, you wanna know essentially four things. We're gonna focus on three of them. Um, you wanna know neuroelectricity and neurochemistry. These are the two ways the brain talks to itself, right? It sends signals between itself electrically or chemically and to the body. And then you wanna need to understand neural anatomy, where in the brain something is placed in place and networks, because very, things very rarely take place in just one spot. It's usually a bunch of different spots working together right? That's what we're talking about. So from the biggest shift in flow appears to be in neural anatomy. And what happens is large swatches, the prefrontal cortex, the front of your brain that's right back here, higher cognitive functions live here. Long-term planning, logical decision-making, sense of morality, willpower, that's all prefrontal cortex. It gets very, very quiet. It turns off, essentially. This is why time passes strangely in flow. Time is a calculation performed all over the prefrontal cortex. As it starts to shut down, we lose that ability. Um, and in fact, we can lose it very, very, very quickly um, for other reasons that I'm not gonna go into. So that's what also what happens to our sense of self. Self is created by a bunch of different structures in the prefrontal cortex. When they start to shut down, self gets very quiet as well. We see changes in brainwave function. So right now we're in a fast moving wave called beta. It's where you are when you're awake, you're alert. Underneath beta is a slower wave. It's known as alpha. This is daydreaming mode, right? The brain moving from thought to thought, not a whole lot of internal resistance. Below that is theta. That's really slow. That's REM sleep. But now there's no internal resistance in thought. This is where like in REM sleep, that green sweater you're thinking about becomes a turtle, becomes an ocean, becomes a planet, right? Ideas move right? That's theta. Flow takes place predominantly, it appears, on the border between alpha and theta, right there. Um, electrically, it's like eight to 10 hertz, basically. Um, okay. Now, we don't live there. 
So flow, every time you make a decision, you go through a decision-making cycle and flow is an action state. One decision is leading to the next, it's leading to the next, leading to the next. Every time you make a decision, you pop out of, out of alpha theta and go up to beta all over the fucking place. Pardon my language. And the difference, be the difference between like Lindsay and me, uh, like in a crisis situation is that top peak performers can transition through all those states. They can go back up to beta and go, oh, wow, if I do this, I'm going to die and go immediately back down to the alpha theta because they know they got it. Whereas I'm going to go, holy crap, I'm going to die and I'm going to stay there too long and I'm going to break a bone, right? Or do something dumb. And that's what you, normal human beings do. That is one of the things that separates professional athletes from the rest of us, that ability. Um, and then we see shifts, as you guys have both alluded to, in neurotransmitters, right? And what the biggest shifts, and look, there are 200 different known neurochemicals and neurotransmitters, and there's, we definitely have not you know, identified all of them, and um, a ton more play a role in flow that I'm talking about here. Um, and so I, I, if I, if I'm talking quickly, I'll say six neurotransmitters appear to play a role in flow. Um, we did the, some of them are completely unproven at this point that your more research is needed, but we know for sure norepinephrine, dopamine, endorphins, and anandamide. There is some proof that serotonin plays a role. And um, there are a lot of very smart people who say oxytocin play a role, including Paul Zak, who's probably the smartest guy in the world right now on oxytocin. I, I, his studies, we can't see his studies because he did them for the defense department. So like, I got it. I like him. He's a nice guy, but I got to take his word for it. I don't take any of his word for anything. I'm just a cynical bastard. So until, it's, until I see the data, I don't believe the oxytocin thing is totally true. Can I piggyback? Have you have you guys looked at any diagnostic imaging such as SPECT scans or brain MRIs? So um, there has been uh, four or five, possibly, it depends how you're defining flow um, for the purposes of the study. But there have been five studies. The most famous ones were run at Johns Hopkins by Charles Lim and Alan Braun. They looked at first, they looked at uh, jazz musicians in flow. Yeah. They, uh, the standard, they played a standard in one condition and they improv in the other, right? The standard was just wrote the improv condition, flow arose in the middle of it. And then they repeated that experiment with rappers. So rapping something that was already written versus, and so there's really good imaging on that. And you see, uh, especially in their imaging, you see almost complete shutdown of the prefrontal cortex. Yeah. Um, uh, the different, the only thing that stays active, and there's arguments on this point, that I tend to agree with Lim and that group, is the medial prefrontal cortex seems to stay active in flow, mostly because, so you know how in flow, you're, what you're doing, it's perfect, but you also can, like you're playing the standard as well as you possibly can, but you can improv on top of it, right? That yeah. improv, that's the medial prefrontal cortex, which governs creative self-expression. You know, if we were saying it for lay people and if we were saying it for scientists, we would say, you know, this helps determine action plan selection and retrieve long-term memories for action plan selection and blah, 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 all that stuff, right? But that's what's the one part that stays active. There've been a couple other studies um, that have uh, also, also found similar things. Some of them have focused on specific things like dopaminergic functions. So how, how do we know that the, the striatum is active in flow? Because there's been specific studies that have looked at that stuff. My mentor, Andy Newberg, looked at oneness with everything, cosmic unity, which happens in flow. And yeah. so he, we've got his all his neural imaging work on that too. Um, so, and it sort of goes on and, and on. There's still a lot of, there's not debate about the deactivation. There's debate about, is it total? hypofrontality yeah. or is it localized hypofrontality? And Aaron Dietrich, who came up with the transient hypofrontality thesis and has argued complete for total is a friend of mine and I like him a great deal and respect him immensely. But I think more and more of the evidence is leaning towards localized hypofrontality. You get a big deactivation, but what exactly is turning off and when seems to be about both how long have you been doing the activity and what is the activity? Yeah. I could be wrong but that's what it seems like. These There's days. an interesting study outside of Harvard where they would put Buddhist monks meditating into MRI chambers and studying brain activity. So I've, 
maybe by no, the end that, of this is, conversation. Is it Harvard or Yale? Because if you're talking about the yeah. Judson Brewer stuff at Yale, he yeah. discovered that this medial prefrontal cortex yep. turns off. We think that's the difference between meditation maybe it was and a Yale flow. Study, yeah. Oh, how, yeah. do, how, how do we put an MRI chamber on Lindsay's head while she's ripping back country? Maybe that's our workaround conversation for the end of this conversation. Well, for sure, we wait <laughs> for Mary Lou uh, Jetson to finish Blue Water. I mean, the secret, the answer is infrared holography is going is the answer to your question because that's how we're going to get a portable fMRI, and yeah. it's coming. Are we there yet? Probably not. That's a super build it, build it into it, build it into a helmet, right? I've been trying to do it for years. I've been trying to build, I wanted to build EEG uh, or FMIR, which can handle the most noise into a ski helmet to see what we can learn. I've been trying to find a helmet maker who worked mm. on it for years. I'd love to do it. Love that, love that. Interesting. Steven, Great. you had mentioned, by the way, um, interesting that you bring up uh, freestyle rapping or rap artists, because I took the eight week course th through Freestyle Love Supreme. And one of the first, on the first day of the class, they were talking about this, this exact thing, that the reason why people are so terrified of you know freestyle rapping or being able, like they just don't have that flow is because their prefrontal cortex or the, 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 the activity in their executive center is too active. And we're too worried about what other people are thinking about us. And so, um, yeah. so with that, I, I wanted to ask, um, so you know so much about the science and how to tweak it and turn it off. What would you do with, all, with this, this superpower? What do you do with the superpower of like being able to go into a flow state like that? I mean, cause these, if I was tr trying to um, utilize flow to become a, a freestyle rap artist, um, yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd be able to turn it on and off whenever I could, but so. I don't think that's true. That doesn't seem to be <laughs> how it works. Oh, so right. the, here's a couple things you should know um, on this one. So it turns out flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. And uh, we're starting to really get a handle on the neurobiology. Most of them drive norepinephrine or dopamine in the system, which are big focusing chemicals, um, or they lower cognitive load, which is all the crap you're trying to think about at any one time. And there's about 22 different triggers. And for example, in our classes, the class that Lindsay's taking, we measure flow pre and post. We've trained a lot of people and uh, we're seeing consistently 78% increases in flow. How are you and measuring it? Uh, we're using the stand Susan Jackson and Chicksep Me High standard flow short scale. It basically takes, I uh, remember I said there are nine characteristics of flow and it uses a Likert scale. On a one through five, you know, not at all to, and um, I, for years, I hated it. Hated it. Like really like I, my whole quest was to create the biophysical waste flow detector because I just didn't like that that particular thing. And I still don't particularly, I would much rather measure something physiological, neurophysiological. I'll be much more comfortable. That said, so many, like tens and tens of thousands, that test has been so well taken and well validated and proved itself useful again and again and again and again. Like the data is so big at this point, you just sort of have to shut up. It's like there's, the numbers are just too big that it gets good results, even though it bugs me. But I, I feel you on that. Wait, wait. So shut up could and you flow explain? Could you explain what you mean by it? Like, uh, the, um, this flow short scale, meaning the scale, like, the yeah. Scale it's, so the scale, problem is, like. yeah. The problem is, it's not that the scale is bad. The scale is great. It's not that this core characteristics of flow are wrong. It's that asking you, Lindsay, you had a flow state uh, yesterday, and tell me how much did your sense of self disappear on a scale of one to through five how accurate are you gonna, you know what I mean? Like that's what yeah. that's what's troubling to me. It gives us, we've now asked so many people those questions that we have information that you could trust, but it's still, you know, that's why so many people have been looking at the neurophysiology of flow. Um, and that's and why the, language is having such a hard time describing it and pinning it down, in my opinion. The language around flow, there's, I mean, this is a whole new language for science, right? You've got to remember that we don't think of it, but emotions were not a real topic for neuroscience until 1996. When that's crazy. This book, Affective Neuroscience by Jan Pansep, got published. 
this was the very first time most scientists went, oh shit, emotions are real. Literally, like they went, they, they, that book traced the neuron by neuron pathway of the seven primary mammalian emotional systems. And suddenly scientists went, well, emotions are real. Consciousness wasn't real till like 2003. So we've come a long way is what Even I'm saying. Real, <laughs> I'm wait, not wait, sure but... consciousness is real. No, and I, and I do partially believe we're in the matrix. And, and at the... consciousness might be real, but I might be in somebody else's consciousness. But weren't they trying to, they were also making drugs at the same time to try to control these emotional behaviors way before 1996. Yes, right? of course they were. Yeah, mood modulators and things like that yeah. way, way, way back. It's, um, but in terms of neuroscientists and philosophers of consciousness talking about emotions and real things, as, and the question of do animals have emotions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that was what settled it. And by the way, there are different, what the drugs were trying to modulate are feelings. So emotions are the primary signal. The minute you say that signal means something, it's a feeling. So they're different. There's sl they're slightly different things in neuro to neuroscientists. Um, really quick question. What did we land on uh, in terms of do animals have emotions? Oh yeah. They uh, do. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, by the way, of course. At this uh, point, okay, like, but like I'm just I, I wanting want, to yeah, know what the uh, scientific community is. David, yeah. the, so, David, you have to understand the discussion right now, and it's a real discussion among real neuroscientists. Are do trees have emotions? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, here so, you so, so I mean, like, let me put it to you this way. So, yeah. what we know, emotions are neurochemicals, right? Like they're produced by neurochemicals. Trees process information with neurochemicals. They exhibit altruism. We know that we've got study after study, they exhibit empathy and altruism. They process information the same way and they sense the environment through pheromones, which is essentially like what a dog does. They smell the world. Um, okay. So they are what, having what? a, like there's a very real, weird, complicated discussion on tree consciousness right now. We, I and love it. it, but how does a tree exhibit altruism? The hidden life of trees. So yeah, the hidden life of trees <laughs> or the secret life of trees. Um, there's like four other books. I'm looking at them. But uh, so if you take a bunch of uh, seeds that are related to each other and you plant them uh, with seeds that are strangers, right? Not related to the plant. The plant will grow away from their relatives so they don't steal light from their relatives and towards hmm. the strangers so they take light from people that oh, so, plants. Um, wait, so that's, that's competitive. Compet that's competition, but it's altruism towards their, their kin. And they will mm. also do the same thing. They'll coexist with other plants and they'll share light and they'll grow mm. apart if they want mm. to, depending on signaling and relationships. Is cool. there also oh, tree sepoku? Pardon me? I said, isn't there also like a tree sepoku where one will like fall over to provide either more light or resources to the neighboring trees? I haven't heard that, though that sounds like something Richard Powers would have written around in the overstory. It was um, in one of those TED Talks about the topic, they were talking about that, how they oh, observe trees. I, did, I didn't know they that. They observe trees that would actually fall over in order to provide like nutrients light for space. its, yeah, light space and nutrients for like their specific descendants based on like the triggers that they were watching. It's so cool. Of course, I feel like we're a little off the topic. Flow. We're way so off coming, the topic, yeah. but, oh. but it's cool because we, <laughs> that was we don't like have a time line. <laughs> we're, that was like our cutoff is 3 a.m. So we got tons of time, guys. Keep going. Uh, we're in flow. So um, one. Go ahead. Oh, David, go ahead. Sorry. No, you're in flow. I just keep interrupting your flow. All right. Go ahead. So you mentioned briefly earlier, first, that flow is between like the uh, alpha and theta waves. And then also you mentioned triggers for getting into flow. I feel like we're at the point of the conversation where we could start talking about how to really get into flow. And your story about your first like two week writing period brought to mind, and when I was finishing my master's thesis, when I say finishing, it was really finishing and starting at the same time because I wrote the entire thing in two weeks after supposedly having been working on it for like a year and a half. And the only way that I did that was I had this soundtrack of waterfalls going with some sort of harmonic music in the background that I just trained myself to hear it as a trigger and just tune out everything else. And more recently, 
I've tried to look into all these different audio tracks that have underlying frequencies trying to produce certain brain waves, brain states, but I've never really come to a good uh, body of evidence showing that they work. So yeah. I'd be really uh, curious so, to hear your yeah, thoughts on that matter. That's, uh, you don't have to hear my thoughts. You could, uh, so Chris Burke, uh, who runs Advanced Brain Monitoring, they make the best EEG equipment in the world, pretty much. She got interested in the question of uh, sleep and sleep training using sound frequency and sound for performance. And they tested using the best EEG in the world, every single biurnal beat, sound frequency, blah, blah, blah. None of them, not one thing produced a consistent neuronal result. They couldn't find anything that they validated. Now, let me also say that the folks who run both Focus at Will, Will Henschel's company, and Brain FM, who uh, is associated a little bit with Northwestern, have been looking at this question, and they have a lot of data that says I'm wrong, right? They have a lot of data that says I'm wrong. I don't, um, I, I don't know enough about the subject to actually, you know what I mean? I can't. I don't yeah. have an opinion. I trust Chris and her neuroscience more than I trust Brain FM or Focus at Will. Um, but that's, I mean, that's neither here nor there. That's just like, I just, you know what I mean? I, I didn't, I know Chris better than I know the other people. Um, uh -huh. you know what I mean? So, uh, uh, and the, to talk about flow triggers, like, uh, you know, I want to go back to Lindsay and just like kicks up. So Lindsay, you said you took a year to get ready to ski that cliff. Exactly. What did you do? Exactly. What did you do? That's, let's, that's, let's, that's, let's bi start, that's biohacking in itself. Yeah, let's start there with what Lindsay did over the course of that year to prep for that cliff, and then we can talk about it in terms of flow triggers. Thanks, journalist Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did I do? I think the biggest one worth mentioning um, that I'm actually most proud of is that I changed my belief system, um, and that was a commitment that I made that uh, we don't really. I didn't talk about or anything. It was it was this experiment of uh, if I could change my belief system, what could I accomplish? And then I tapped into this other belief that um, that we're told all the time, which is that we are one. And if we're really one, then I should be, even though I'm being told a female body can't withstand this impact, uh, and that and uh, only men can, you know, because we know that um muscles are built differently in men and women uh and so i had to really change that belief in my mind and that was the thing that i'm most proud of and it what it it showed me is why i am so in glad that i have this work in, in that we it taught me that we can choose our uh our limitations and the only limitations we truly have is our how big of a belief system can we hold even in a game even uh, as an experiment um, and so um, that's the biggest thing. And then after that, it's just the little things like uh, Steven says too, it's like showing up time and time and again, again at the gym because uh, it's, I wanna see if I can do this thing. And, sh uh, and showing up, you know, at 5 a.m. at the mountain over and over, you know, watching the snow, learning every, uh, every bush, every like uh, tree on, on a mountain and then doing the visualization to live it true even though i hadn't seen it so i had to create the vision and then live that true with practice and showing up for it all the time and um and i i, I always say just building this life that most people wouldn't think was possible it was the same sort of belief system i i decided to do one thing a day toward that crazy dream that i didn't necessarily tell anyone about and um you know i'm sitting in it now so um awesome yeah. I love that, but you're a unicorn. You're not a normal girl. You're a unicorn for sure. Just but, another belief system we can all choose to adopt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by the way, Lindsay and I disagree with you already on this one. We were talking about it the other day. Like that's the real thing. I think you learned. So Andy Huberman, Dr. Andrew Huberman, who's at Stanford, who we work with at the, from the collective, he said the most brilliant thing the other day. Uh, that is so true. He said, if you really get to know peak performers and he does a lot of work with the teams and the spec ops group, they will all like the one thing every peak performer knows is it's always crawl, walk, run. Yeah. That's the thing, by the way, that peak performers know that mo everybody else thinks there's a shortcut somewhere. 
what peak performers know is it is always crawl, walk, run. So you don't waste any time looking for a shortcut. Yeah. You know, right? Like that. the thing about learning is it feels terrible because you're bad until you're better. It's invisible. Learning sucks until it doesn't. Yeah. And it sucks for everybody. And one of the main differences between peak performers and everybody else is that peak performers already know that. They don't expect it to feel any different and they don't, they're not mad when it sucks. Yep. They, right? Like it doesn't like, oh, it's going to suck for a while. Okay. That's just how this feel, this, this part of this particular process feels. Um, oh, we're mad. We're definitely mad. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay, do you know you so said it's too? Oh, I get mad too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we no, all. I just mean, I mean, it's just so humbling. Like yeah, I've, been, humbling. I've been attempting to learn how to surf and it is beyond humbling. And it sucks to suck at something, especially as an adult. It and doesn't look yeah. like you suck, though. Well, it, it's, oh, God, it sucks. Man, I'm in no. a huge uh, a plateau right now with uh, this new foil board. But, but this is something I want to share with women is that, yeah, um, actually, it is uncomfortable for the first five or 10 times. But if you're willing to get through that first five or 10 times where your boots yeah. suck and it's freezing cold, then I promise I'm going to show you some magic. But, like, let's get through it. Um, and nobody exactly. really talks about this stuff. And uh, yeah, super refreshing. So the other thing is, the other also, we know, this is sort of backwards facing. We're going to come back to the flow trigger thing in a <laughs> second, but this is really an important thing to point out. Flow itself produces, creates grit. And for example, if you look at incoming high school freshmen, uh, and you look at their, what they call their primary sec, their primary secondary activity. So high school is their primary activity. So maybe they're in marching band or they are football. What their primary secondary activity, freshman year, the greatest indicator of will they still be doing the seniors is how much flow did it produce as freshmen. Flow is so fun, so autotelic, so rewarding. It it's what eases the suffering, right? Flow is what makes yep. the grit worthwhile and peak performers already know that, right? It sucks at the beginning because you haven't started getting the flow that is gonna reinforce this thing that you're doing and then it's not gonna suck as much. So it also you sucks if you've never had someone before you show you that you belong there, whether, yeah. you know, from whatever diverse background that needs to see this. Yeah, so now I wanna come back to the, let's talk about flow triggers, let's talk about the thing you were talking about, the belief system. Um, there's a big picture one, but the small picture is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, often called the godfather of flow psychology, identified a number of uh, very early on uh, three flow. He, he was the first person to figure out that there were three, he called them proximal conditions of flow or flow triggers. And the most important one has always been what's known as the challenge skills balance. We flow follows focus. We get into flow and all our retention is in the right here, right now. We pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge of the task slightly exceeds your skill set, right? So you want to stretch but not snap. And when researchers look under the hood of what the hell do we mean by challenge and skills, you see about seven to eight different categories. And they're everything from competence, tolerance for anxiety, ability to get gratification, societal values, sometimes uh, wealth and educate, you know, uh, social, socioeconomic conditions can matter. Actual skills also matter, right? But most of those are psychological skills. Confidence, especially among elite athletes, where skill levels are fairly equal, can be 81% of everything that we mean by challenge and skills and able to stay in that sweet spot. So the first thing she did is to reframe this thing that was impossible as possible, which gets her in the doorway. You cannot, right? And they talk about that in, in, in uh, in Rise of Superman, I write about the banister effect, right? Which is the fact that you cannot accomplish the impossible until you believe you can accomplish the impossible. And it's literally about the correlation between the visual system and the brain. That's how it, like, it's how it works. Um, and there's a lot of really cool science around why it works. But it was named after the fact that banister ran the four minute mile. It was a fucking crazy impossible. It took forever, 70 years to get there. And yet a month later, Somebody else beats his time by a lot. And a couple months after that, somebody else beats his time. And then a 10 year old or an 18 year old has done it. So like, what the hell changes? It's still a sub four mile. What used to be impossible suddenly became possible and it became possible for a whole lot more people. Right? It became so the standard. 
It became Kansas the new Center. belief system. And then well, everyone and, and could do and it. Look at your look at your cliff. We were talking about this the other day when we were talking. Your cliff became the standard for women, right? And yeah, suddenly there were all these women like coming for you. They wanted your job. And how were they coming for you? They were hucking 75 plus foot cliffs because Lindsay told them it was possible. Well, right. How dare you, yeah. Lindsay. <laughs> So oh, it is really cool to see where it's come. Um, there's a lot of talent that has come this way, um, yeah. which I'm loving to see. And I can't wait for more to be like, oh, I could beat her. You know? Exactly. People that are going to stretch and not snap. I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Lindsay, do you know your Colby personality uh, test by chance? Have you heard of that? Steven, no. if not, uh, these peak performers, is there like a quintessential score? Um, and then I'm going to go into an accessibility question. Um, Lindsay, you're, you know, you obviously have been a backcountry skier and it's so fun to see you like evolve as a friend in your career. And now you're kind of entering into another phase. I would love to share with our listeners what you're doing next um, and how from an accessibility standpoint. So is now the weekend warrior, a CEO, but that still likes to go out into nature and get those flow states. How can, Stephen, if you can kind of explain after she answers, how can the normal Joe reach those flow states before going in, into the boardroom, for example? I can't wait for you to answer that, Stephen. <laughs> um, so, you go do you first. Want to? No, no, Colby, you go first. Colby personality score. Lindsay, do you know? If not, you got you to gotta report post. Got it. Okay. So now... And then just, uh, you know, explain, kind of give a shout out to what you're doing. You're, oh, you're getting, okay. well, first, when you say next, um, I feel like I'm what I'm doing and, um, because there's Love still that. two, yes, there's exactly. two, Love there's that. two, Thank you. <laughs> there's two really big, um, athletic, um, drivers right now that, uh, that get me up in the morning and scare me, uh, that I'm, you know, you don't talk about yet, you know, you know what I mean? Those things. So I'm still very motivated in that way. Uh, and so I hear a lot of people saying, what are you doing next? And oh, you're, you're really, uh, uh, it's time. Yeah, I don't know, just, uh, I've been doing this for a long time, the ski thing. Um, and I feel like I am just starting to have my mind, especially with this training, um, meet the strength of my body um, as where I've never felt that before. And I'm, I'm really applying it in a cool way. So that's athletically. And, uh, but I'm also having this opportunity to get to share. Um, we're leading a course around this fall, the really doing of, of what we talk about. You know, we, we're so, uh, we, we have access to all these amazing talks and we know exercise is good and we know mobility is good and meditation. And, um, this is a course to actually do, do it do the doing together. Uh, we'll meet once a month. Uh, my, I'm resetting with the uh, Fisher skis and they are supporting me in uh, offering this to uh, people who show up and sign up through an application um, for six months of the doing where we will all, you know, start with goal setting and, and achieve it. Um, and Steven's going to be a part of that too, as far as like, like leading us out on the science of the goal setting and how we reach these peak states because we are in unprecedented times. Uh, the future is ever more. By the way, Fisher and has to bring back the vacuum boot. That's, oh, you I'm said willing it. to do I it. I'm willing to do it. it. They can have me for free, but they got to find me an old pair of vacuums <laughs> before I do it because they well, kill and, and for, for ski fans, like, the, one of the reasons Collar is so rad is because he obs he's obsessed with buttering, and buttering is rad. If, if you're a skier, you <laughs> want buttering? to feel this sense of style, we'll have to explain it. But it just oh, feels so good, and it shows It shows a lot. So anyways, <laughs> where was I? I got lost in my train of thought. Are you are in your, in, in your, um, in your and phase of life. Your, your, your next Steven's going to be a part of um, this, this and moment. Well, my mission, violence. my mission is to, is to represent the divine feminine in the mountains and, nice. and show that we can, we can, uh, we can fly and, awesome. uh, and we are rooted in love and, uh, and, and what can we, we're so much more capable than we thought we could. We were. So, 
so now how can this epic person, Lindsay, that's been in a flow state her whole life, now move into this and moment and another career and apply her flow states to more of a white collar position, if you will. So that's the accessibility, Stephen. How did how does that work? How can the how can the white collars learn from this lesson? So um, I'm going to mostly talk about flow triggers, but I want to start with something that Tasha said because she uh, she had on a really important point, and it's worth bringing back, which is she goes out and does the thing that she loves and gets into flow and the next day shows up at work and the result is heightened productivity, heightened creativity and more flow. And that happens for two different reasons. Reason one is the obvious flow is a kind of focusing skill, right? It only happens when our attention is in the right here, right now, but it also means it's a kind of particular attention where we're paying attention without the prefrontal cortex being totally active, et cetera, et cetera but it's a skill and you know, all the mindfulness research teaches us that we can train up focusing skills. So every time, the more flow you get, the more flow you get. So when you get flow on the mountain, when you get flow, you know, whatever, we call it your primary flow activity. So don't, this is the main mistake people make, especially as they get more and more successful is they stop doing the thing that they love that produced the most flow, right? Cause children and marriages and jobs and et cetera, get in the way and you're costing yourself. You're costing yourself because this is your main training for flow, right? Like you're training your brain to get there. Also, um, speaking specifically to what Natasha was talking about, uh, this is not my research, this is Teresa uh, Amable at Harvard discovered that the heightened creativity that shows up in flow and a lot of different people have tried to measure it. We've tried to measure it, the Flow Research Collective does some, they tried to measure it at the University of Sydney in Australia, a couple other people and it's, it's huge, it's a 400 to 700% boost in creativity. And creativity is literally using the technical definition, the creation of novel ideas that are useful. So it's a 400 to 700% boost in that. And if you break it down into all the subcategories, problem identification, all the other things that go into creativity, we've tried to measure all those things to and flow and they still look like that big. So huge boost in creativity, productivity come also because of all the feel good chemicals you get during flow, those linger on um, and you see exactly what you see. So one way to get more flow in your life is literally don't stop doing the easy stuff that produces more flow. Um, there's really good neurobiology uh, that shows like do that. And it's exactly what people get busy and they stop doing those things. All right, now- So let's... if my business partner comes to me and says, why are you playing video games right now? I'll say, it's mm -hmm. Stephen Culler's fault. Dude, he said you're... it makes me get flow. <laughs> yeah. This is the easiest thing Stephen is do. not. Stephen is not wrong, but like, remember, like I, I still ski two to three times every week, but I, when I'm not skiing, I work 17 hour days. Uh, okay. And when, even when I'm skiing, I usually work seven hours and then ski, ski eight hours. So like, um, I don't think flow is an excuse not to work. I think flow is an excuse to work more. Um, but uh, uh, the, so, uh, the, so let me ask, yeah. I've been, Rudy, I've been dodging your question a bunch and I don't mean to. So let me just answer it quickly and then we can get on to a more fruitful discussion. One, really important for our people to understand, one of the most well-established facts about flow is it is ubiquitous, it's universal, it shows up in anyone, anywhere, provided certain initial conditions are met. This is how evolution shaped our brain to perform at our best. It is available to everybody. It is utilized by everybody. In fact, research shows that 5% of your work life is probably spent in microflow without you even noticing it. Um, so the, it's actually, microflow is actually pretty common and we just don't notice. Um, all of the flow triggers, as I said, drive attention in and out. So you want more flow in your life, those triggers are your toolkit. So for example, dopamine uh, drives flow. If you want more dopamine, well, you can use uh, novelty, right? Why do you, when you travel, do you get so much flow? Because everything's freaking novel and anytime you see something novel, you get a spike at dopamine and focus gets driven more into the present. You see something else new and it, again and again, complexity. So you've experienced awe, you look up at the vastness of the night sky, right? That's, it's very complex. 
and you experience awe, time seems to slow down. That's the front edge of a flow state, same kind of reaction, right? So complexity will do it. Unpredictability will do it. Unpredictability is why our phones drive dopamine, right? Maybe they liked me on fa Facebook. Maybe they didn't. Oh, I got that like, cool, more dopamine, right? Um, risk, emotional risk, intellectual risk, creative risk, physical risk, of course, obviously. But it, there's no priority to physical risk. We've been talking about it because it, it's Lindsay and me as well. You know, there's a bunch of accident sport athletes on the call, but, you know, it doesn't have to be physical risk at all. In fact, public speaking is the number one fear in the world, right? Yep. So, like, you really want to go after this one, right? And, you know, mm -hmm. talk to any frequent public speaker. They'll tell you that in a good speech, you don't know what the fuck you said because you were in flow yep. the whole time, right? Like, right. I, if I'm in flow during a speech, the only time I know that, like, like it's when it's over. Like people start yeah. clapping and I'm like, wait, yeah. where the hell am I? What happened? <laughs> yeah. du duly noted, I'm gonna have my daughter on skis her whole life and a musical theater. Good. <laughs> um, so there's also the challenge skills balance. This is so critical, right? If you are, you asked, David, you asked a question earlier about anxiety, right? We, this is where we mm -hmm. started. This is, mm -hmm. we finally come back to your answer, which is with the challenge skills balance, if you're anxious, the challenge is gonna to be too great. So we always say that with flow work, there's a bunch of peak performance basics, the positive psychology basics, the dumb stuff, regular exercise, mindfulness, gratitude practices, healthy nutrition and hydration, social support, um, and, uh, and sleep, right? Without those six things, you can't do this on a regular basis because you can't rise to the challenge. So you gotta like those, you gotta, take care of your energy level physically and emotionally using all the basic stuff. And then you want to like, when you go, you want to be in attack mode, right? You flow. There's more and more evidence that you actually have to trigger the fight response to actually get over the hump and into flow. So like, you're always going to go from like this moment of like frustration of, Oh, this is hard into I'm going to fight back. And then you might drop into flow almost immediately. Yeah. But there's yeah. always going to be that moment of, eh, you know, and I, uh, we've all, everybody here has ridden a mountain bike. Yep. yep. Okay. I figured you guys know this experience. You go out mountain biking and you think in your mind on your way there, you're like, Oh, it's a bicycle in the mountains. It's going to be flowy and mellow. And then you get on the trail. And that's and all you remember from the last ride. And that's all you remember. And then you hit the trail. <laughs> the first thing you remember is you're like, Oh my God, this is a violent sport. And if I try to be flowy and mellow, I'm going to get my ass kicked and go to the hospital and you've got to get into attack mode right away. But there's that moment where you're like, oh, fuck, I got to work that hard. And then you dive in and suddenly you're in flow. We've all had that experience of just like, oh, crap. And then you dive in or if you're a skier and you come up on, you're like, oh, crap, there's, you know, a thousand feet of bumps in front of me. I'm going to have to do some work here. Right. Like and then you do and it drops you into flow. Love that. All right. Yeah. With all this, by the way, with all this talk of like anxiety and risk and physical risk, um, would you, do you give warnings um, with, when it comes to flow or recommending flow? I mean, is there a dark side to flow? Because. Yeah. So there's I a bunch mean, of, there's a handful of things we're talking about here. It's a good question, David. Thank you for bringing it up. One, like if you try to take our class, we'll, we interview everybody. And one of the reasons is we are screening for bipolar disorder because if you flow produces a massive amount of dopamine and if you have bipolar disorder, you're going to have a problem, right? That's it'll say, or if, or if you're, or if you're schizophrenic also same problem. Yeah. So there are mental health concerns around who should do this work for starters Two, as I don't remember who said it. I think all of you said it one way or another, um, this is really addictive, right? You're talking about the five most potent neural, feel good neural chemicals you can produce. And like, these are in, you know what I mean? We do cocaine, all that happens is dopamine gets released in the brain, right? Endorphins, there are 20 different ones, but the most common endorphin in the body, these are internal opiates, right? Is the most common endorphin in the body is a hundred times more potent than medical morphine. These yep. are usually addictive drugs. And if you get a lot of them and then you get cut off from them, it does not feel good. And 
Yeah. You know, you can have depression, you can have problems. And when you have an experience like I had where you're a writer who's used to getting into flow every day and you get writer's block and you're locked out of flow for six months. I was suicidal before yeah. I went mountain biking. Like before that happened, I was literally like, I was punching the floor on my office. I was so frustrated. Um, I thought I was absolutely crazy until I heard Davis Foster Wallace interview where he talked about the fact that sometimes he got so mad writing infinite jest that he would punch the floor in his office. And I was like, see, it's not just me. Yeah, I mean, That's how I feel when reading infinite jest. <laughs> but the quintessential example is rock and roll artists, right? They're on stage, they're in flow, and then they get off stage and they want to continue staying in flow. And they're, well, that's, you know, they're artificially enhancing that. And then the next well, yeah. day they're on a bus, they're not recovering. And it's this constant, like, wanting yeah, to be in that, that was by state. The, and, we, and when they get off tour, they're having significant problems. We saw it in uh, surfing over the past five, six years, all the drug overdoses on tour. Yeah. You know, how many professional surfers we lost in the past five or six years yeah. for that? They don't, like, the flow is a big high. So somebody... Yeah. Or just coming break. right off a tour. Yeah, so you asked yeah. this question earlier. So I want to, we'll talk a little bit about recovery, but the first <clears> thing I, I want to say, um, we have t-shirts. The only swag the collective has say, never trust the dopamine. And first of all, don't decision make when there's lots of dopamine. Like don't go shopping when you're in flow because everything looks freaking good. And you'll spend all the money in your wallet. You come home and you'll wake up the next day and be like, Wow, single-handedly reinventing '70s polyester disco fashion—not yeah. the idea. Or, I thought or, or, or relationships. Right. Or relationships. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the what other do you mean thing, relationships? What do you mean? I've yeah, never experienced a bad relationship. I've only been with my wife Linda, but I've seen other friends fall off with too mm. much dopamine. Mm -hmm. And oxytocin, uh, com do like it's a combination <laughs> of the two, right? So what 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 I see is people who get really good at this. And so a lot of people have poked at this. Maslow, Abraham Maslow, the great psychologist, talked about the plateau. He liked peak states, but he was more interested in what he called plateau states, which weren't as high, but were much more sustainable. You cannot live in flow. It's neurobiologically yeah. too expensive, right? You have to cycle, come in and out. But one of the secrets to getting back in Right, like Natasha, I think was talking about like going back to work and back to work and back to work and you're kicking back into flow because you're working on a project kind of thing. One of the secrets to that is don't ride the dopamine high too high. So yeah. like at a certain point, for example, if I come back from skiing and I'm really, 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 um, it was a deep flow experience and I'm really fired up, rather like I could start, I could go, I could do what Avisha does and go down a rabbit hole of like, thought right and like follow the neuroscience down some rabbit hole for like three hours and use up all the remaining neurochemistry i have i don't i get into a hot bathtub or a sauna and i you know i'll start reading like dumb thriller fiction or something that will literally cut that off and totally force state change so i don't burn out on the dopamine i find that's one of the secrets to really sustaining it over time but also you have to sleep. Wait, wait, sorry, can I stop you? So I, what I heard you do, do earlier is you went skiing and then you got into many, many hours of flow writing. Is that, is that? Well, I would space? go so skiing. So why wouldn't you want to use no, that I, Oh, I would rather wake up the next morning and work because I'm too tired after skiing to write well. I'm really not. But you're not still getting, high. I'm still you're high. Still... Right. Yeah, I'm still high. I'm still high as a kite. Um, and it'll just, my thoughts will loop. Dopamine fires up pattern recognition. So one idea leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next. It's not going to stop until the dopamine is gone, right? right? It, doesn't, it doesn't stop. Um, so I have to turn it off, With right? Delta, you know, delta waves of sleep. You can, delta wave sleep is a, you know, is a great, so I'll do everything, you know, I'll get in the sauna, I'll uh, Epsom salt bath, I will force myself to relax. That's the only time I'll actually use TV. It's the only time... When yeah. I'm trying to get out of flow, I'll use TV. Um, okay, so okay. go back to go back to just finish on uh, how this applies to relationships, and then I'll let yes. you guys. I, this, <laughs> I don't. Stop, that was I'll not my interview. comment. I always tell people, like when it comes to relationships, don't trust. I mean, I've had a long marriage, so maybe you could trust me on that. But like, I don't know. I'm not a relationship expert. <laughs> That's one okay. of that, perhaps. Well, then, well, what were you talking about, Dr. Rudy? 
uh, I'm not going to name names on this conversation, but people in dopamine highs and uh, hyper excited states at certain parties, and then they have the Burning Man girlfriend for a couple of days. Right. And, you know, it's like, oh my God, I'm in love. And like, this is my end all be all. And then they go back to a normal state of reality and like, what the heck are we doing? That makes so much sense but this, given what Stephen was saying about the shutdown of the prefrontal cortex, which is the seed of decision yeah. making. <laughs> yeah, and what Stephen is suggesting here long is that planning, we should all take risk cold assessment, showers. Long-term planning, risk assessment, these go out yeah. the window and flow, there you go. right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, it's not like the, it, the state is great for certain things, but it's designed for specific things. It's not, it's not an all-purpose tool. We should do a research project on failed relationships after Burning Man to prove this point. Yeah, and then also- Rudy, you don't have to prove it, right? Like it's right there on the ticket. <laughs> don't make any life-changing decisions for a month after the festival. Yeah. They literally, it's on the ticket. I'm quitting my job. I'm you know, breaking yeah. up with my wife. I'm, I'm getting married. It's hilarious. Uh, but yeah, with it's relationships- why I don't so go to Burning Man. Well, there's a lot of other reasons, but that's and one of them. And it's not happening. That's not year. one of them. <laughs> what? I don't think I'm going to leave my wife at Burning Man. I get annoyed by the people who are, I don't like being around people who are like wired on dopamine because I'm like, wow, you sound like a moron. <laughs> mm. so, uh, so can you bring flow into relationships, Stephen, Lindsay? Sure, like, of course. Like, group flow. Questions. They talk about it. So group flow, which is the shared collective version of flow. And there's, they, they do... Uh, subdivide group flow uh, into a lot of different categories. And one of it is interpersonal flow, right? You and another person are a great conversation, right? First time Lindsay okay. and I sat down to talk, we looked up five hours later, right? We were on that couch and neither of us, both of us were working and both of we just like turned around and we we're like, what the hell just happened? That's interpersonal flow. Okay. Uh, but if it comes to romantic relationships, right? I don't know if you saw Vanilla Sky with Tom Cruise and Penelope Cruz, um, delayed gratification, like you got to delay it as long as you can. So that's kind of playing into what you were saying to just like kind of dampen, don't ride the dopamine, dopamine high too high. Um, does that relate? So I don't, at all? I cannot remember Vanilla Sky. <laughs> I saw it, but it was <laughs> probably, yeah. So you I were in flow when you saw it, so you I definitely afterwards. wasn't in flow when I was, I was annoyed actually, I think, when I saw okay. Vanilla Sky, if I, I remember I correctly. Um, but uh, uh, no, so uh, I did, what, you know, we know that uh, all the neurochemicals that are produced in flow are social bonding chemicals. and flow is actually more so romantic love is the cocktail of norepinephrine and dopamine that's what romantic love is that's what creates that feeling the dopamine the norepinephrine is the racing thoughts i can't stop thinking of the person salience oh my god right that's romantic love flow is those two chemicals plus three more that are also social bonding chemicals endorphins are like mother child bonding serotonin is the pro-social common chemical right it means like if I'm comfortable around you, we're all buddies, I get serotonin. If I don't know you super well, you don't get as much serotonin. Then mine, oxytocin. So very pro-social chemicals. Flow is really great for relationships. And certainly couples that spend a lot of time together in flow, I'll tell you where this really actually matters a lot in a, in a really interesting way. So we have been doing a lot of work trying to figure out what does peak performance look like at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum. Because there are lots of, if anxiety matters, if you have to work three jobs to feed yourself and you're raising three kids, your levels of anxiety are through the fricking roof. So how do you, what does flow look like for you, right? Has been an issue that we're dealing with. And one of the reasons it's so important is if you've only got 20 minutes a day with your kids, that 20 minutes better really count. And the best way for it to count is if for it to be group flow. Because then you've got all those heightened social bonding chemicals and a lot of accelerated learning. So it can be a lot, you know, it's better quality of time. And this is, we've been looking at it. It's a very difficult context to try to do this kind of work, but it's a really, I think it's a worthy cause. And this is exactly where we've been studying that question. So that's the accessibility point. And what would be the easiest, cheapest way? What's the take home message for the family that can't afford going on an epic ski trip or- But you, I mean, you're missing the point. I'm not like, the point is clearly not an epic ski trip. The 
point right. is, um, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the most important thing I think um, is starting your day with 90 minutes of uninterrupted concentration for the most important task you have to do all day and practicing distraction management on the front end. So you go into it with everything ready turned off. And then you said, and 90 minutes is specific. This is the period we focus the best for. We are designed the way that REM sleep is designed for 90 minutes. So our periods of awakeness and alertness were biologically built to be focused for that long. The research consistently shows that this is the period for complete concentration. It's the most important thing you could do. Start your day with a 90 to 120 minute period of uninterrupted concentration and, and de- use it devoted to your hardest task. For me, that's writing, right? And I do more than 90 minutes. I'll write from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. every day. But that's the most important thing I can do. And then my attitude in my writing is I've tuned the challenge skills balance right. So I am, in writing, this is easy because I know that if I'm trying to write a thousand words in a day, that's super difficult, but not yeah. impossible, right? So it's right. So that's but- how I do it. Um, and, but to each his own. And, you know, so that, those are like, it's really practical and simple. It's not, the biggest problem with flow <laughs> hacking is it's so unsexy. Yeah. There's no whiz bang pill. There's no, I'm like, there's three or four things you should do every day and, and ways to approach the things you do. But what's okay, the example with the family? Now. What's the well, example with the, with the family? The family, I mean, sometimes with families, like even just novelty, right? Like just get out of the local, go to a park, go for a walk together in an environment you haven't been in, right? And the, and certainly a walk in, a, a walk in nature is always a good, a good fix because it, it calms yeah. us down, right? We know a 20 minute walk in the woods essentially outperforms most of the SSRIs on the market. Um, so stuff like that is, is, is sort of really simple stuff with families, I think. Um, Thank you. Also, I like, you know, there's rhythmic games, rhythm, there's a, you know, there's a lot of, first of all, there's novelty complexity and unpredictability sort of built into rhythmic games, but there's something about rhythmic movic that tends to entrain people. There's things like that. If group flow is not, so if the least studies of everything and the, the one of the reasons that we're looking at this very question is I don't think anybody has a great answer on group flow. We are getting to the point we can measure individual flow, but like, how do I put a group into a scanner? You know what I mean? Until we get yeah. infrared a lot, like, I just don't know. They're, they're looking hard at this. This is not my group, but the Platypus Institute, David Box group, um, Arne Dietrich, who created the Terence type of frontality hypothesis with them. They've been looking hard uh, at this question of group flow. And Michael Siegel has been working with them to try to develop some technology for it. So at some point soon, we'll have some technology. Can I add to what you're saying here? Please. Um, for families, um, would you also suggest getting outside in nature as a family and scaring yourself a little bit, like you're saying on that skill, on that scale, you know, how can you challenge the situation to the point where you're gonna have that time where, Do you, what, did you see how close you were? Oh, blah, 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 in a good way, in a healthy way? <laughs> so, Liz, it has its- Liz, yeah, a couple things I, let, let's, so first of all, I always tell this to people whenever we start talking about questions about families. I don't have children. I don't want children. I don't like children. I'm not an expert in anything. Okay, so I'll take this one. So, I'll take this one. But what I will, will say um, on this stuff is I don't, like, I can't, I'm not going to tell parents to make risky decisions for their, their kids, but what the research shows is boy, it's probably a really good idea to teach your kids how to take risks um, over and over and over again, right? The research is really consistent on it. And, mm. um, you know, the, the difference between the generations, I grew up in a generation where you could fall, you know what I mean? Like I had broken so many bones by the time I was out of high school. Um, it was silly because um, I grew up in a generation where you could run outside, you know, for 10 hours at a time and, and break things. Mm-hmm. So the only cool. other thing I, I yeah. wanted to add on to have Kotler talk about was like, you know, he's talking about all the ways to get into flow and, and why you want to be there. Um, but really, could you, could you talk a little bit about motivation and what comes even before you start taking those actions? Yeah, it's a good point, Lindsay. So 
we talked about flow states having triggers. It is very clear that curiosity, autonomy, mastery, passion, purpose. These are your big five intrinsic drivers, your big five intrinsic motivators. They're all essentially flow triggers and they don't work by themselves. They all essentially produce dopamine, right? And a little bit of norepinephrine, but when you start stacking them, you, that's where you get real power. And while I don't, we don't tend to teach this, we used to try to teach this to people before we taught, train them up in flow. And we found that it's really hard to train people in the, like the, the hard work of motivation until they've started to get some flow. But basically you have to have curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. So curiosity, all, multiple curiosities is how you create passion. When you take your individual passion, you couple to something greater than yourself, that's purpose. Once you have purpose, you need the autonomy to explore your purpose, the freedom to just look at it, and you need mastery, which is the ability to develop the skills to go after your purpose. And these are the big five intrinsic drivers, and they should be stacked and aligned. And when they are, the big deal here is focus. Our brain is an energy hog. It uses 25% of our energy at rest, right? And so, you and most of that energy when you're actually activating the brain is spent on focus. It's really energetically expensive. When you're motivated, when all your intrinsic drivers are lined up, you get focused for free and you don't have to expend energy for focus, right? When people talk about motivation, what they usually think about is grit. Grit is what you need once the motivation runs out. When you properly stack your motivations, you have to rely on grit a hell of a lot less, right? Because um, grit, and grit is a tradable skill too, but it's hard and you've got to earn grit and grit doesn't really get rewarding until it's generating a lot of flow. So you want to start with all your intrinsic drivers, I always think. Gosh, Thank that you. is such a great takeaway. Thank you, Lindsay, for bringing that up. Um, I know we are coming up on time, but we have some rapid fire questions that we definitely want to get out. Um, so Avisha, do you want to kick that off? Sure. One quick question for Steven, which is we've been spending this whole time talking about all the underlying aspects of flow and how to structure a mindset to get into it. But if I were to say, or if I were to ask you, you've got $100 and you are to buy some tools to help you get into flow fastest what would that look like either from things you have purchased or just you would recommend based on all of your expertise right now? Uh, it could just be a single item that costs not too much that you think. So there's two answers here, but if you've got a hundred dollars and you're really aiming for flow, mm -hmm. <laughs> I would probably be spending it on a cup of coffee, some really good sativa and some <laughs> iTunes songs to play on my <laughs> walk. Ben. I mean, like I, you know, like it's, you, there's not really flow in a pill, but that's, um, you add in a couple other things and you're going to get, you're going to get close to that. That's not the exact answer you want. Um, I don't really, I, like what a pair, good pair of hiking shoes. Like you can't get that for a hundred dollars anymore. Yeah. So I like, I don't, <laughs> You know, that was what was popping into my head. Like, I don't, and that's just me. Because the other thing you have to remember is there's 22 different flow triggers. Not everybody's super susceptible to all of them. This is my point to Lindsay with the risk. Not everybody is wired for risk, right? There are, there, like, for example, my wife is not at all. She, we run a dog sanctuary. She runs and she works with animals all day long. Her favorite high is the altruism based flow state known as helper's high, right? It's a flow state brought on by altruism. Same triggers at work, but it's altruism. There's not much risk involved um, on, on that one, um, other than the creatures we're caring for. We do hospice care work and special needs work, so they're usually very sick and dying. So there's risk there, but like she doesn't want to go out and do any of this stuff, right? So it's it's genetic, it's nature and nurture. We're not, you know, everybody's dopamine receptors are differently activated, et cetera, et cetera. That's not why I'm so excited all. to help spread this message uh, in different languages, you know, for mm. from, from different triggers. And your wife is such a good example of that. There is this, I would call that divinely feminine. And that's not a woman, man thing, right? Um, 
uh, my, my fiance's mom is one of the kindest, sweetest women in the world. And she just needs to, she's with plants all the time. Um, and it, it's like this other communication uh, that no one's talking about and it's not in the science. And so I'm excited to help you, you know, broaden your reach in that way too. Love yeah. that. Thank you, Lindsay. Love that. Yeah, we all know. Right? Lindsay, wait, I, yeah. I just want to, for clarification, you're going to, you're going to find me a big fan base among the plants. Because one, I think the plants like me already. I they just have to say, like you, you I have to say, I've got a good, some of my best friends are trees. Um, <laughs> but what did they sacrifice themselves you. for you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, okay, so Lindsay, I have a question for you. It's a kind of a rapid fire question and going based off of the um, motivator stack. All right. So what would you say your motivator, your flow motivator stack is like, or what's your stack? Could you? Uh, why do you do what brain? you do? Like, it's kind of like, why do you, why do you do what you do? Are you doing it for the glory? I know we were talking about this a little bit beforehand, okay. right? Um, but what drives you? Is it the glory? Is it the, do you have, you know, to help people or to show, feeling. you know, you're, yeah. What did you say, Dr. The, the feeling, is it the feeling or, you know, showing what you can do? Uh, for me, it's a is it's an idea of this feeling that it will be um, once I get there. Um, a big motivator right now is I really want to fly with dolphins, like check that off the box. And so I'm trying to figure out how I how to get there. Um, there were definitely times uh, that I probably wanted to prove something, and that motivated me. Uh, there were. Um, oh, cool. oh, Oh, I'll stay there. Well, let's let's start um, from the top on that one. Um, I've definitely been motivated by, uh, yeah, and the impact I could have, um, and found out I could I could do a lot less than I hoped I could, which was also really disappointing. Um, when you're talking about you know helping others, and the best way I think that I can do that is by reaching my highest potential, and then saying like this is these are the tools that I used and that's why I'm so excited to be offering this course and say hey I, I want to reach this new goal do you want to join me because yeah. you know we're so isolated and we're uh our world has shifted and I think we need each other and why not all step up to like what we once thought was unattainable or impossible together you know and and see how it goes so love that thank you for that yeah awesome all right Stephen um I know you have a book coming up uh, that's out in November. Is that correct? No, I got a book in January, Art of Impossible. Art of Impossible. Art of Impossible drops in uh, January 15, That sounds okay. so boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Lindsay, I know. Um, I, I, I'm sorry about that. And uh, God, I didn't even have a good comeback. <laughs> Shit. Don't funny. worry, we, we can uh, we can edit this. You've got time. Yeah. I got time. We'll just yeah. we'll just splice it in to like right okay. after she says that. Very right, cool. Although speaking of books, that brings me to another question. You're sitting behind this or in front of this massive bookshelf. You've written eleven books. In the last year, what book has really stood out to you that you enjoyed? Honestly, I'd like to know both fiction and nonfiction. I know you're in fiction. The genre fiction. Oh, uh, fiction. There's two. And it's hard to pick between the, no, a fiction I, Charles Yu's How to Live in a Science Fictional Universe. Have you ever heard of this? No. Sounds um, very it, appropriate. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, so it, it, it first of all, it, he's great. He's an awesome novelist. It's very fun. Um, and it is the coolest book on time and memory that I've ever read. I can't, I won't even, I'm not going to tell you anything other than like everybody should read this book. It's a blast. First of all, blow your mind. And if I tell you anything else, it's going to give away too much. Um, but how to live in a science fictional universe, though close second is John dies in the end, which is also maybe the craziest book I've ever read. Fit novel John, or John dies in the end. Right. Um, Love that yeah. title. Um, both nice. are, both are astounding. And, Nonfiction, Jesus. Um, the best nonfiction book I've read. Um, it's gonna probably be a super geeky science book. Um, 
that's my favorite type of books. So by all means, <laughs> it's the only books we know. Okay, I uh, I'm reading. Um, you're gonna ask me who it's by, and I'm gonna have a hard time pronouncing his last name because I always screw it up. But I'm reading Rhythms in the Brain by Buzaki. So I've been reading a bunch of books on neural dynamics, which I don't understand at all. Um, there are very well, and I'm trying to understand, which is like, we talk about brain waves, right? But like all mm -hmm. the different brain waves in the brain interact with one another as electrical fields and things like that. And those oh, are yeah. neural dynamics. And I've been trying to learn about that. Um, Rhythms of the Brain is maybe the slowest book I've ever read in my, uh, in, in at least a very long time. I can read like four pages at a time. And then I just got to think for a while. Great. We know those. Okay, I totally can turn this. I'm sure we could all go for hours and hours talking about this and we've been chatting. We have to turn this into a, a second episode. Um, so we can't wait for that opportunity to bring you on again. But in the meantime, I wanna thank you so much for joining us this evening for this fabulous conversation we had. I learned so much. I took a whole bunch of notes. I can't wait to share it with the world. Is there any way I could ask one more question or are we on a hard sure. out? No, I got, go I'm ahead. dying for one question for Lindsay too. I'm so okay. sorry. Yeah, sure, go no, ahead. Not for yeah. me, but uh, Kotler, why is flow so important right now given the times? Love that. Um, uh, so I, so three or four reasons, Linz, um, and uh, no particular order, but, uh, you know, flow is, flow appears to be, and this is well established in positive psychology, like the meaning, purpose, well-being, all those terms, when you ask psychologists to define them, flow is literally baked into those definitions, right? Like when they talk about the best we get to feel on this planet, um, it's uh, a high flow lifestyle attached to purpose. That's what that literally that you want the best life you could possibly have. Find a high, find something you do that makes that betters the world and produces flow. And you're like, you're, you're so like just at a simple, like human being, I would like to, I would like my, my life to matter and I would like for it to feel good. That matters to everybody. For me, the, the really big levels. So, for example, we are doing a little bit of work with law enforcement right now. And we're not doing work with law enforcement because they want like peak performance. We're doing work with law enforcement because flow over time has been shown to expand empathy and perceptual and environmental awareness, your ability to perceive them, right? So like you want people who are not reacting on instinct. You want people who are empathetic, who can pause a second and make good decisions and that demands flow. So from the from a like, you know, empathy and the most important one, and you, you, you know, I feel this way. So thank you for the softball pitch over the plate. So I get to <laughs> talk about what, what matters most to me in the world, which is I care the most about plants, animals, and ecosystems. I'm a, yeah. I'm a big believer in empathy for all. And that means, you know, yeah, empathy for all people, but empathy for plants, animals, and ecosystems. And oh, I, here, here, here. so flow, automatically expands environmental awareness. Why does this matter so much? There's 50 years of science that says when you, your brain can't process reality, it's too much information, right? And it filters out all the crap that's unimportant, that's not threatening your survival or doesn't directly apply to your goals. So when you live in a box and you stare at a box all day long, what goes away? The plants, animals, and ecosystems. Yep. We don't even see them. So if you talk to psychologists, um, eco-psychologists who literally study how the brain interacts with the natural world, and you say, hey, why are we in the middle of the sixth grade extinction? Why are species die off rates a thousand times greater than normal, right? Like what the hell is going on? It's not just that the industrial revolution, you know, helped and hurt too much. It's that the byproduct of the industrial revolution is we now tune out the natural world. We don't even see it. We don't perceive the very thing we're trying to fix and save. Flow is the gateway drug into environmental perception. But I can't convince people to care about plants, animals, and ecosystems. I've tried my whole life, 
written three different books in town, so I've given thousands of speeches. It's very hard to convince people to like plants, animals, and ecosystems. You have to, you have to get there through experience, right? You have to mm -hmm. get out into the world and experience those things and start to understand their value. And they has, it has to start. Like I always say that environmentalism starts at home. Most people start to like animals because they like their dogs and their cats, right? That's their first, like, that's the gateway drug of, oh my God, animals have emotions and yep. intelligence and holy crap, they could be your best friend. Like most people, right, the, the animals in our lives and our homes, these are our gateway drugs into environmental consciousness. Flow accelerates that. So I think empathy, environmental awareness, Plus, you know, finally the last thing I'll say, and then I got to get out of here, but this is a good place to end. Um, and Natasha, I feel like an asshole because you haven't talked at all, but you're in the middle of my screen. And, um, <laughs> She's I'm very self-conscious about it, but- uh, um, And there's a delay. The one thing I want to say is that the, what a lifetime spent studying human performance has taught me is that we are all so much more capable than we know. Right, but capability is an emergent property. You only figure out what's possible for you by pushing yourself to your edge of the, your abilities and then pushing some more and pushing some more. But like, that's what, like, why is flow so neat? Because we're all capable of getting really damn close to Superman. Maybe we don't all get to be Lindsay Dyer and hawk 80 foot cliffs, um, <laughs> but we can get a hell of a lot farther along uh, than we want. And by the way, if you want to hawk 80 foot cliffs with Lindsay, you could take her class this fall, I think. And it sounds like she'll get you off the cliff. No, so you'll get yourself off the cliff. Can you also just for a second, is this just for wealthy people? Is this just for the elite? You know, tell, tell us who this is for. Well, it's for everybody. I mean, it's ubiquitous. It's, this is our birthright. That's the craziest thing about it is like, you know, people want, they want flow in a pill or they want a technology. I don't, I'm not interested in it. I don't study those things. I don't study the pharmacological and stuff and I don't study the technological stuff because uh, the story I always tell is that like, I, you know, I was shot at on five different occasions as a journalist. And none of those occasions could I look at the dude who was shooting at me and be like, excuse me, sir, would you put down that AK-47 while I take this pill and get into flows, dodge your bullets? Right? Like when you need peak performance, you need peak performance. I don't want to rely on technology or I want to rely on my own psychology. Everybody's got the psychology. Like it's, this is all of us. This isn't, there's no, there's no gateway drug. It's just what you choose to do with your brain. Epic. Yeah, absolutely. Epic. <clears throat> this Love is, all this. I think we've uh, arrived at the pinnacle of biohacking right here. This is definitely it. Um, when we talk about peak performance and why we do what we do, it's all about trying to get into this flow. So, Gosh, beautiful. I love it. Um, beautiful words. Thank you so much, Stephen, Lindsay, and Biohack the World team. I had a fabulous time. All right, guys and gals. Hey. Thank you. Thank you so Good night, so everybody. Much, Thank you so much for spending some time with me. Yeah, it's great oh, to meet you guys. Our pleasure. Bye, Linz. Our honor. Bye, Linz. Bye, Cutler. Bye, Bye, team. See you guys.